really happy to see all you uh, all of you here after this delicious lunch. So, uh, do we have any pivotal people here? Okay, great. Enough with this spring nonsense. Then let's <laughs> go to go to fundamental concepts. Uh, that's a joke. Spring is great. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So, my name is Alex Life, and I come from a company called Zero Turnaround, and from the country uh, that is called Estonia, which is uh, further north north that I would like. So, I really enjoy Barcelona in May. And we're going to talk about uh, the session that is called Flavors of Concurrency in Java. So uh, let's talk at first a little bit about myself. So why should you listen to me and why, why I'm here? So as I said, I work for a company called Zero Turnaround and I'm a developer advocate, which means that previously in my career I have written enough code to be uh, called a developer. And now I moved on to the community parts of things, and uh, I mostly care about people and try to enable other developers to be more productive or smarter or wiser. So there are two main responsibilities that I do. I handle the, uh, our blog that is called Rebel Apps, where we publish technical content, mostly about Java, JVM, and so forth. And I'm a co-organizer uh, and lead of the Virtual Jug, which is a uh, Java user group taken <coughs> online, which allows you to participate in the Java community without actually leaving uh, your home. So uh, we do two sessions a month, and you can join that, and it would be amazing. It's really great. And you can find me on Twitter. I would be happy if you ask me any questions or just chat with me. So zero turnaround, uh, well, the people who send me here, uh, we develop products for Java developers, and we have two main products nowadays, Jarable, which is a productivity tool that can instantly update your code in a running JVM, so making you a more productive developer. You don't have to waste time restarting your application again and again. And Xrebel, which is the profiler uh, for web applications uh, for developer. So we use that in development time, and it can enable you thinking about performance proactively rather than waiting for people to complain that stuff is slow in the production. So if you check this out, my employer would be happy. They will send me to more places to talk to. And maybe next year I'll come here as well. And I'll be happy. So without further ado, let's talk about concurrency. First of all, this would not be a very deeply technical session that will be focusing on some particular approach or something. But it's an overview session that goes through several models of computation, how to organize your concurrent code, and tries to give you an overview uh, of the approaches and options that you have. Why do we care? Well, because we want our applications to be fast, right? We want, we want throughput through the roof, latency to the minimum. And for some, some amount of time in the past, we could achieve that by doing nothing, right? The computers, the hardware uh, got faster and faster. And you can spend half a year sitting in a garage doing whatever, and your application will get faster. But at some point of time, the Moore's law kicked in, and it just they couldn't fit more transistors in a single chip. So they went multi-core. And that was their architectural uh, change. And that enabled this, well, not enabled, disabled this. Uh, bonus of application getting faster without doing anything. So now we have to change our application to accommodate for the multi-core architectures to use multiple CPUs. And if we do not take the, uh, if we do not use that hardware resources, then we are often find ourselves in a situation like this, uh, where we do have the resources on the hardware level, and we do have this ability to execute more things at the same time. But in practice, uh, well, it just leads to the situation where one particular bit of application, one uh, flow of the logic that you wrote in, takes all the resources and all the rest are just standing there waiting. So we would like to avoid that, and we would like to understand how we can structure our code and what, what options are available for us on the JVM to, to uh, avoid this. Uh, embarrassing situation. So we want to go 
concurrent and we want to enable parallel computations. And in this presentation, we kind of will use terms parallel and concurrent interchangeably, kind of meaning the same thing. But there is a distinction, and I just wanted to illustrate that at first. So on the bottom, you see the illustration of a parallel system. There are enough resources to make progress simultaneously. Uh, multiple entities can make progress simultaneously. So we have two queues to the coffee machine, we have two coffee machines, uh, and both coffee machines can serve people at the same time. So when entities make progress simultaneously, that's the parallel computation. The concurrent system is the one that is capable of par parallel execution, of executing multiple uh, control flows at the same time, but it doesn't necessarily have to do that. So on the image above, you see that there are still two queues. So the architecture of the situation hasn't changed. But there is only a single coffee machine, which represents the limited resources that we have. And the system on top is concurrent. It is kind of capable of doing multiple things at the same time. But in reality, because of the lack of resources, simultaneously happens only the waiting part. And if the, your entities just wait at the same time, the system is not parallel. But it is concurrent, meaning that if you add resources, you will be able to get uh, better throughput. So the illustration is by Joe Armstrong, who is the author of Erlang, the language. So he knows a thing or two about concurrency. And uh, I would like you to, whenever you hear the term concurrent or parallel, to think about this illustration to kind of put the things into perspective. So why concurrency is hard is because we have multiple entities that really need to communicate between each other. So if, if you have the situation like with two coffee machines where two queues were served simultaneously, there were no communication ha happening. And this is the easy case, right? When you can isolate the processes efficiently and they don't need to share any resources, this is easy, but in reality, we will design the systems to run in the situations where the resources are limited. So we will need to m make sure that the operations that we specified, our programs or parts of the programs, communicate efficiently. And this is really hard, especially when we have the shared resources, because as soon as you uh, do threads of the execution or two processes share memory, you will have to think about uh, locking bits and pieces of memory. You will have to think about ordering events into different components of the system. You will, uh, you will, you will have much harder time than with the isolated system. So in theory, parallel computation happens like this very neatly. Every puppy has a bowl of food, and they all nicely eat and consume all the resources that the reality has, uh, has offered them. In practice, the situation gets a little bit messier. And mind you, those are the puppies. They are easy to control. And uh, they are simple, simple actors uh, in the universe. In, in the computer system, everything is much harder, uh, first of all, because well, there are more resources to take care of. And there are many more entities that want to make progress than puppies want to eat. So in this session, we're going to go through this table of, table of concurrency models. And we'll start at the bottom. And we'll try to cover just managing the concurrent computation using those model, models of uh, organizing code. So we'll start with bare threads that you manage by hand. And we'll go into the organized thread pools and executors into the for join pool framework and we'll look at the completable futures and how types can simplify your concurrent programs. We'll go into talk a little bit about actors and how message passing done right could simplify your programs. We will cover the topic of fibers, the lightweight threads, and how, how you can use that to the benefit. And we'll kind of mention the software transactional memory, uh, the crowning achievement of current understanding how concurrent system could be made. 
the most important part is I would love you to go home after the session with an understanding that whenever you want to solve a problem that includes uh, involves concurrent computation, you can pick any of those models and basically go in every step further up uh, from the hardware level, from the bottom, you will have a different set of trade-offs solved differently. So if we, if we understand how using thread pools is better, in which ways is better than using just threads and managing them yourself or up further, this would be great. So without further ado, let's start with, with going through this model. And this illustration talks about threads, naturally. And a thread is a smallest sequence of programming instructions that are independently managed by a scheduler. And this is the definition of a thread from Wikipedia. And what it, what it gives you it gives you the ability to specify the, the, the behavior of the program that potentially can happen in parallel in your program. So you can have multiple th threads running in your single program. And in fact, if you're running a JVM, then you are running multi-threaded application. Because well, even if you don't spawn additional threads yourselves, at the bottom, there will be like things like garbage collector and so forth, which will run concurrently with your application. So the time passes, and different threads take order of execution, and the JVM gives them ability to access the computational resources. Kind of easy. So why do we want to use threads, and why this model is good? Well, first of all, it's the closest one to the hardware. This is how the hardware operates. You have multiple cores. In the core, you have multiple chips, uh, CPUs. And they execute instructions on those CPUs independently. And the operating system handles your access to those hardware resources. And basically, the JVM that sits on top of the operating system handles your access to the uh, hardware threads as well. So. Think about a thread as a process, like operating system process within your JVM. It has its own memory that it can write to. It has its own stack. It has its own set of instructions. It just runs in the same JVM so it can share memory and communicate with other threads. And the model is really simple. It follows the hardware. It's the basic building block of any other uh, model for concurrent computation. So the thing with, uh, with threads is, coming back to the uh, previous slides, is that we will need to make them communicate with each, other, which, with each other. And we can handle that communication using different means from just using plain objects and fields on the JVM heap and make different threads just go and read values from them. There are plenty of implementation of the atomic primitives uh, in certain packages uh, in the JDK. You can, you can, instead of just writing uh, values to the heap, you can specify a queue of messages and communicate through that way. Or one of the, my favorite ways, maybe not, not the most performant one, is to write the data into the database and just not make, you, might not make your threads communicate with each other directly, but just read and write values from the database. But the thing is, you will have to make an efficient program that runs on the same data and you will want to run different entities on the same data, you will have to ensure that you have uh, specified the communication patterns. And this is really good until you start thinking about, whoa, how, how, can, how can I be sure which values my one thread could see uh, that the other thread has produced? And on the Java language level, there is a thing called Java memory model. It's it is specified in the book called Java Language Specification. Who has read the Java Language Specification book? Who has seen the Java Language Specification book? What color is the cover of the book? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the PDF, so <laughs> supposedly it could be white. So uh, 
it, what Java memory model explains and describes and specifies is how the language constructs in Java allow you to reason about what values given threads can read and observe from the memory. So if you will work on, on uh, concurrent systems, you will need to really read that chapter of the specification several times. It's a complicated read, so uh, it still beats undefined behavior that you get on some other platforms uh, because you can be sure about what, what your program is actually doing. So using threads uh, and using concurrent computation will boil down to figuring out what Java memory model says about your program. So I should notice one thing. So when we talk about concurrency, we often want to solve the problem of how to make our application faster, and we'll talk about performance. So talking about performance is great, but it has to be very concrete. So without concrete examples of the programs, without concrete implementation of the programs, we cannot say which approach is faster or more performant or less performant. So in this session, we will not, not talk about performance per se. We'll just uh, figure out how, how you can structure your programs. And we will do that, but we'll still, I wanted to, to show you pieces of code so you will get the visual understanding how, how things move through the progression of those models. So we will do that using the problem-oriented programming. So we'll pose a problem, and this will be a simple yet uh, a very concurrent program. Uh, what it will do, imagine we have a string, which is a query, and imagine we have a multiple search engines uh, available somewhere in the internet. What we will want to do, our snippets of code, we will want them to go and query those internet services and return the fastest result. So imagine the stub of our code for every one of those models, uh, almost every one of those models, will, will be like this. So we'll have the, the question string, the, the query, and we'll have the string of URLs for the search engines. And inside that method, we will implement this query, all of them, and return the fastest result uh, using certain, certain methods of computation. This is clear, right? Everyone is on board. Yet, that's amazing. So let's, without further ado, jump into threads. And oh my God, there is a lot of code. Uh, not that much. My code is tinier. So uh, let's go into the into the examples. So what we do here, we exactly query the all the databases and imagine that we have this web services class that enables us to fetch the URL from the internet. The exact implementation of that is not important for the implementation of the, this uh, get first result method. But uh, there are some things that are more important in this code than others. So in a nutshell, a thread is a process, and it's also an object uh, in your Java code. You create that. It has a certain API. It has a life cycle. So you create the new object. You specify what computation you want to execute in that thread. You start the thread, and now it kind of runs. So the actual work happens inside the uh, ws.url.get method, where we actually go into the internet and fetch the result. But concurrent code is about communication between the entities in your code. And this is achieved with this atomic reference uh, object. So an atomic reference uh, is a part of the atomic uh, uh, Java util uh, concurrent atomic package. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to execute atomic operations, basically the operations that are either fully, the result of which is either fully visible or not get there uh, on the heap. So what we, we can do, with, what we can achieve with that is fetch the, actually the first result that came back to us. So we start multiple threads, and we had the, had the uh, for loop over the engines, and we 
create for every search engine that we want to create a new thread. And the API is stupid simple, just new object dot start. And inside the body of the runnable that the thread uh, accepts, we utilize this atomic reference field to, to get the result only once. So we compare the value inside this atomic reference with null. If we had seen no previous results, boom, we write down the result that we just got. If the expectation does not match the reality, so somebody else uh, changed that result before us, then we do nothing. So the code is pretty straightforward, and it's really easy to do so. And if you, if you need a one-off task that you want to execute in the background, uh, using better threads is a preferred approach. You create that, you uh, drop it down. It doesn't, doesn't take that much memory. You won't get that much overhead. Uh, the communication can be made very efficient, and there are multiple of uh, implementations of the atomic uh, objects that you can use to communicate between threads in the JDK. The downside of that is that when you, when you create new threads like that, especially in a loop, you can get into a pretty uh, grim situation where your hardware runs out of the resources. So the takeaways from threads, and I don't want to spend that much time on that because, well, this is very kind of basic things. So all the, every thread takes resources, and it just not just the object on Java heap, it also creates the uh, memory space for its stack and its private memory to operate on the resources. They require a lot of manual management, and you can really easy to go uh, over the top with creating new and new threads and just starve your system out of the resources. So it's very simple on the, it's very easy on the API level. Uh, the life cycle is pretty straightforward. You create a new thread, then you start it, then it dies at some point of time, and it can be interrupted to stop. But it's really not so simple to design a complex uh, multi-component system using that, this low-level approach. So if you know what you're doing and you are prepared to solve all the complexities with managing them and managing the memory and resources that you allow them to use yourself, this is great. Just go with bare threads, close to hardware, easy to reason about. You have a specification that helps you to reason about the program and everything is fine and shiny. However, as developers, we are kind of lazy. That is the virtue of being a developer, especially if you're a Haskell developer. Uh, and so we want to take part of those pains and uh, put that on somebody else's shoulders. And with that, we go into the executor's land, which basically says that we will deal with organized groups of threads now. So the currently, the only primitive that we looked at was just the, this simple notion of individual process within the JVM. And now we will organize those threads into a pool of them. So we will create a pattern in the code that will allow us to have multiple threads that will be ready to execute tasks that we give them concurrently. And they can independently be managed by the JVM scheduler or a scheduler that you would like to specify. So think about this, this image, also courtesy of Wikipedia. You have a series of tasks that you want to solve. You want to compute those uh, bits of operations. And you will have to put them into some sort of a queue from which thread pool will be able, all those individual threads that somebody else manages for you, they will come and take the tasks and say, oh, now I will deal with this part of computation. And they will complete them at some point of time. So in the JDK, that notion of the thread pool, there is this class, exists a class called thread pool, but what you would like to use is the executors. And that is the interface that basically a very simple interface. It, it has the execute method, and you specify the uh, part of the code that you want to execute in a certain thread pool, and you get no result. Basically, you stack, you stack side effects into your code. There is a better uh, 
interface that you would actually want to use, which is executor completion service, where you would be able to submit pieces of computation and get the expectation of the future result back. And you will be able to call the take method to access the completed tasks. So executor completion service is what you would like to use in your code. And let's take a look again at the get first result problem. There is even more code, but let's go from through that uh, piece by piece. So at first, we will need to create this thread pool. And we will need to create this execution completion service instance for us. So luckily, the JDK comes with multiple executors pre configuration for the executor for the stride pools pre-packaged for you. So it, it all sits in the executors class. And the most common and the most reasonable configuration of the thread pool that you will find there is the new fixed thread pool method that takes the level of parallelism, the number of threads that you want initially uh, to be ready in the thread pool, and will give you the thread pool that consists of that many threads. There are other options, like a cached uh, thread pool and single thread thread pool, uh, but those have very limited use cases. So if you construct an executor, this is the way to go, unless you are really hardcore and know what you're doing. So now we have this executor completion service ready, and we are ready to submit tasks to that. So what we do, we will need to uh, specify a task uh, as a callable, and this callable takes nothing and returns the result of the, this internet query. And we just say, oh, service, please accept this task and make sure that somebody deals with it. This is much easier than actually creating a thread for that, and this is uh, quite simple. And to achieve the first result, to, to get the, achieve the functionality of getting the first result rather than anything, the code is as straightforward as well. You just say, oh, my execution completion service, uh, I would like to take one result from, from, from you. And when the result will be available, uh, the first one that comes in will be in that execution completion service. So the code, you can see the code is much more straightforward and focused on the task at hand. So you specify the business logic rather than configuring this concurrency and parallelism levels and creating threads yourself, basically somebody else will configure the executor for you and you will just use that, which is a great thing because you can always, almost always, push that responsibility to a more senior developer in your team. If you don't have a more senior developer in your team, somebody else will push that onto your shoulders. But the thing is, while the code, the consumption of this uh, concurrency model is simpler, the questions that you have to solve, the inherent uh, complexity of the, uh, of the problem doesn't go anywhere. So imagine you have executors and you have this queue of tasks. So now you will have to solve the question, do I want this queue to grow forever? Do I want to limit it at some point? If I limit that, do I spawn new threads to accommodate for those tasks, or do I cancel the uh, accepting the incoming tasks? How do I cancel them? If somebody comes to me and, and tells me, oh, please do this, but I have no capacity, do I tell them, oh, please go do that yourself? I have no capacity. Or do I just throw an exception and hold the universe? Uh, those questions are basically the same that you will need to solve with uh, managing threats yourself, but they come with a nicer API, and they come with this ability to make this somebody else's responsibility. So at some point of time, I run a survey uh, on which model of uh, concurrent computation people use. And using executors and thread pools what the, was the pre preferred approach because of the simplicity and of the API and basically configuration. So the takeaways for executors are very simple. The configuration is that simple. You can achieve bounded overhead with much more simplicity than using threads yourself. Uh, but in fact, what it does for, for you just push this complexity deeper into the code, not 
just one miraculously avoiding solving those hard problems. But this is, this is a great approach. Basically, you know, they say when something is easy in, the, in computing, in programming, when somebody, something is easy and cheap, that means that somebody else has paid for that, which is a great notion to remember. So pushing complexity deeper is great. It's like making a certain framework handle dependency injection for you. No references. Uh, so the next approach, going from organized threat pools, we are going into smarter threat pools. And uh, this is an image of a robbery. And we were going to talk about the fork joint pool framework. Initially, the fork joint pool framework was created and added to JDK in Java 7. And it was sp specified and made uh, for solving the recursive tasks. And recursive tasks are which the tasks that you split into multiple similar tasks, solve them, and then combine their results somehow. But at some point of time, they re well, between the 7th and the Java 8, then rewrote the implementation and made it really great for general uh, parallel processing tasks. And why is it great and why is it really smart? It employs the work stealing algorithms where you do not manage a single queue of tasks. But every worker has its own small to-do list where it can put additional tasks. What it, 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 it allows you to do, it allows you to use underutilized worker threats to go and help their buddies. Basically, they can go to a busy uh, uh, worker threat and just say, oh, let me help you with this task. Let me reveal you from doing that computation yourself because I have resources and I can do that. So, and the fork joint pool framework uh, got so incredibly great, state of the art, that basically it started to, well, in Java 8, they introduced streams and par parallel streams. And basically, when you parallelize a stream, by default, uh, it uses the parallelization from the fork join, uh, pre configured fork joint pool that comes on the JVM. So looking at the code, for the same, for the same, uh, for the same problem, exactly for the same problem. The code is really straightforward. So we just take the list of uh, engines and we stream that, and we say that oh, now we want the stream to be handled in parallel, and now please for every element of that stream, please use this uh, function uh, that we map over the stream. And basically, in the function, we say that now for every element, for every this query string, just please go and fetch the data. And then we just call find any on the stream, and we'll get some result back. So this is amazing. The code is that simple. The best part of that is you don't even have to configure your own thread pool. You don't have to solve those problems with the queue size bounding that or not bounding that. People much smarter than, well, much smarter than me has pre-configured that thread pool for you. And for joint pool is just an executor. It implements the executor interface. It comes with additional methods to submit asynchronous tasks or submit tasks and wait for the results. But in a nutshell, it is the, just the same executor, but very intelligently pre-configured for your particular JVM uh, and particular hardware resources that this JVM has access to. So this is great. And look how simple the code becomes. This is amazing. Uh, the caveat for that is that you would really not want to do this in your production code. And why is that? Because the, when you parallelize a stream, you will use the default pre-configured forgeant pool dot common, the one instance of the forgeant pool that the whole JVM shares with everyone who wants to access that. So when you Take that and you say, oh, please, every worker on this forge and pool thread, please go to the internet and fetch me Google. What you make, make them do, you make them stall. Basically, a network operation is very expensive. It's blocking. It can take indefinite amount of time, usually 30 seconds, uh, unless uh, something else happens. And during that time, no other, other component in the system will have access to, this, uh, to the resources. 
because all the workers in the four joint pool actually are busy doing doing stuff for you. So whenever you use four joint pool, think about this: either create a new four joint pool using some specifically crafted thread pool. It's exactly for that purpose, or execute only instantaneous really uh, operations on the common one because, well, you want to be nice to the other components in the system. So don't do this in a, in a single word. There are, there are means and there is a managed blocker class that you can use to say, oh, now I will do the blocking operation on this particular forgery pool instance and please the system recompensate for that. I know that I will block and I know that I'm not really polite with resources here, but uh, please maybe spawn a new thread uh, and just compensate for that. So while I am waiting for something to happen uh, on the other end of the internet, the local resources and local computation can continue using that additional thread, which is great, but uh, takes a bit of uh, getting used to the API. So for the presentation purposes, uh, it's not on the slide. You have to Google that. It's called managed blocker. The takeaways for the uh, forgery pool is that it's really efficient. It's state-of-the-art implementation of the executor. It's pre-configured. It's really easy to get right and used on the API level as a uh, consumer. It's really easy to get wrong and actually stall the whole performance of the JVM. So do not mindlessly parallelize all the streams that you have in the, in the application. That's it. And with this amazing image of the Hoover board, we go into the future. And we are going from this, if you remember the initial table that we had. So we had bare threads, uh, organized threads, forging pool, and then we had three separate uh, entities on top, not a single, uh, a single level. And it was, first one was completable futures. And what those signify is that basically with forging pool, we kind of achieved this place where we are really efficient and at handling the hardware resources. And basically, it doesn't get better because on the hardware level, those are all threads. So now we will need to use threads to do the parallel computation and we'll need to configure them. And basically, for join pool is where you, you get with the configuration. It doesn't get simpler than that. It's pre-configured. So now we'll go into the uh, options, how you can organize your code to simplify the use of those resources. So using the completable futures, again, we have uh, quite a bit of code here and go uh, side by side. So the completable future is the type, right? It, is, uh, it helps you to use types to represent the asynchronous concurrent computation that happens somewhere in the future or has happened already. But you are not really sure. So what you do, you uh, stream, again, you stream your uh, search engines, and you just say, oh, please, complete the future. I know that I want this task, this unit of business logic to be solved. Uh, please take this runnable and somehow organize this uh, computation to happen in the background, because I want multiple of those be running. So you do that using the completable future class. You can just say, oh, please supply a sync this computation, and you give it a runnable. And well, uh, basically, that's it. After, afterwards, you will have to go back and uh, somehow process the result of those multiple completable future computations. Most probably, you will uh, collect, uh, collect them using a stream API or something. Uh, but what, what I want you to know about the completed future, that this is, is this is the type that sits in the Java Util concurrent package. It represents the result of the computation that hasn't happened yet. And you can efficiently and very easy on the API level to mm, use it to perform background computation or multiple computations in parallel. The best part is that not only you will have to, you will get the ability to say, oh, please execute in the background. The better part is that you can chain the behavior that you want to happen in the background, uh, like in parallel, using functions. So you will be able to chain 
the computation on the result of that not yet happened computation and just asynchronously supply the code that will handle that. So completely futures are great. And if you want to really get a taste of that and how to do that, there is an amazing presentation by Tomas where in an hour he took an HTTP client uh, that uses the usual uh, synchronous approach and rewrote that uh, using the completely future APIs, going through different APIs and what you want to think about those. Uh, and it's a, one of the best presentations that I ever saw. It really was really amazing. So if you want to understand how to better use completely futures in your code, check that out. That's a great question. We will handle that in 10 minutes. Uh, we go into actors. Do, 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 do. Uh, so actors are the universal primitive of the concurrent computation. So what, what it can do, it's an individual entity that can receive and send messages to other actors and perform some computation and modify the, its internal private state. But the thing is, with actors, it's kind of the the concept of the actors is the concept of how object-oriented programming was initially thought of by people who thought of object-oriented programming. They wanted entities in your system to communicate using immutable messages and just basically uh, saying each other what to do. And the actor model uh, embodies exactly that. So imagine you have some immutable classes and immutable objects that will represent the message that uh, entities pass back and forth between each other. And then you will have uh, the, a little bit of code that just specifies that, oh, the example of the code is um, ACA, ACA actors. So it specifies that, oh, I want this class to become an actor. And when it gets a message like this, I want it to do something. So, and when the result is there, I want my actor to communicate back to whoever told him to do something the result of the computation. So very easy, basically the same delegation model that you have in your project where a project manager comes to you and says, oh, please do that. And when you do that, you come back and says, oh, yeah, achieved. Uh, what, what is great about the actor system is that you will have to configure the whole system of the actors. Basically, all the entities that you want to uh, employ to solve some computation, they will sit in an actor system. And an actor can solve the problem itself, kind of do the computation, or spawn additional actors uh, to handle parts of that problems or the problem itself and just delegate. Because of that, it creates a very nice tree-like structure of delegation. So, and that tree-like structure is really great. So if you do not like the untyped actors where you basically just communicate using the side effects, just, oh, I got this message, I did something, the result is somewhere on the heap, but I'm done with that, you can use typed actors. And basically, you will just need to create an interface and use the natural typed actor, uh, natural Java approach to uh, calling methods on that. And instead of uh, just calling synchronously methods, it will pass messages to the corresponding actors, which will get you back some type safety and make your code much simpler. So actors are great. Some people say they're really, really way to go. Uh, what you want to think about actors is that it's all about the sending messages between entities in the system. It's how the object-oriented program was initially thought of, and it's it allows you to multiplex and create millions of entities to run on a, on a single JVM using the resources. And it gives you the amazing ability to handle the supervision and errors uh, in the system. Because of the tree-like structure, if the actor that cannot perform a computation comes back to you and says, oh, sorry, I didn't handle that, it doesn't itself have to uh, think about the error parsing or error handling. It just comes back to you and says, couldn't happen. And then you, as a supervisor, can decide what to do with it again. At the same time, you can easily distribute that. And it's a great paradigm. So look into that. 
fibers. This is where the uh, mind bends a little bit on what JVM can achieve. So when you have the usual threads, they take quite a bit of resources each, and the JVM handles the scheduling of those. So the context switch between different threads can be quite substantial, especially when you have millions of threads on a single JVM. It will need to pick one of those, and the context switch becomes expensive. So for that reason, the concept of lightweight threads that are scheduled by a custom scheduler on the JVM has been uh, introduced. Other languages do that as well. On the JVM, there is a library called Quasar, the implementation of the fibers uh, by the Parallel Universe uh, company people. And they're really great. The thing is that they, they do not share the hardware thread resources in the way that you think of them. What they do, they allow you to specify uh, using annotation and the bytecode modification processing, they allow you to specify methods that you would like to interrupt, be able to interrupt in the middle of computation, so uh, and suspend, and then they offer you the thread-like API of the fiber that you can say, oh, now please do not create a thread, but create a fiber that will run on this specific scheduler, and run your code inside that using the suspendable annotations, what it will enable you, it will enable Quasar to freeze this fiber and to combine the whole stack of that particular thread, well, fiber thread, uh, into a continuation task. So basically, you ca it can make a little bit of progress. So for example, write bytes into the network, and just without waiting for the result, it can stop itself from executing, wrap up whatever it was doing into a continuation task, and then allow other fibers to take those hardware resources and do something. And later, at some point, this continuation task can be rescheduled, and then you will have the access to the previously, uh, previous state that you had. So what it enables you, it enables you to create millions of entities that can make a little bit of progress individually, and basically, stop between them and uh, reschedule and reshuffle the resources on who does what on the fly inside your normal Java methods without doing anything uh, special, but just slapping an annotation and adding a Java agent. So it requires a very specific use case for that to be like an amazing performance gain. But in a nutshell, given that you don't have to do anything specific to the code base, uh, just slap a couple of notation and replace threads with fibers. Uh, this is a really interesting approach. So about fibers or lightweight threads, they use continuations to uh, wrap uh, the current state of the uh, program execution into a continuation task. They are really useful when you have to make a little bit of progress uh, in a million of entities. It's, it uses bytecode modification, so it can be maybe a little bit incompatible if you use other bytecode modification things, and it is a highly scalable approach. So fibers for the win, yeah, available in the JVM. And we go into the top, top, top thing that we had, uh, the software transactional memory. There are multiple impl implementations of that available on the JVM. What essentially software tra transactional memory is, it creates kind of a database-like structure on your Java memory heap. Basically, it uh, enables you to atomically uh, write into the piece of memory into an object. Uh, so other entities on your system will either uh, see all the results or none of the results. So uh, kind of using the atomic. So ACA STM package is probably what I will go for, for if I need uh, software and transactional memory uh, on, on the JVM in Java. And a larger example maybe here is that you will have this atomic object where you can atomically change uh, regions of memory. Uh, so after this atomic execution happens, all three of those entries will be put in the hash map, in the transactional map, and either you will see all of them that are together or none of them. So basically, it's kind of like a database, and you have atomicity, consistency, and it's 
isolated. It's not durable because it's in memory. There are problems that will happen. What, what, what should we do when the transaction fails? Should we retry? Should we fail the transaction? And there are multiple approaches to that. But uh, that is the additional reading, uh, the exercise with a star in it. So during this session, we went through multiple models. And what I wanted really to do is to organize your idea of how different approaches on JVM could happen and give you an idea that maybe there are some libraries that to, you want to use. And I have a sign that it's game over, but I will ignore that for just 30 seconds. There are two really great books that I want you to recommend. One is Seven Concurrency Model in Seven Weeks, uh, which is much better than promising you to do something in 21 days. Slides are available on the internet, so I will choose the slides. Going through basic, uh, through different models, it's a really nice book. And The Art of Multiprocessor Programming, the Bible of the concurrency, uh, concurrent computation books. All the examples in this book are in Java, so you will be able to read and parse them without knowing what a pointer is. Uh, it's on the recommended list uh, of Intel, and it's a really, really great, hardcore, basic, fundamental book. And that is it. Try the things that the Zurich Around offers, and find me and chat with me. Now the question. Well, I mean, like, yeah, you are. Uh, one, one second. Do we have time? Can we have some time for the questions? Good. Yes, according uh, ACA STM model, is it uh, on software uh, level or is just a, yet another implementation of, uh, I don't know, on the language level? So the For ACA transaction memory, I mean. The question is, is ACA software transaction memory library uh, is the uh, oh, application level. level, is it a library, or is it the language level construct? Yeah, ba like? based on CPU, like, I don't yeah. know, so new it, generation of uh, Intel CPU is going to provide this ability. Yeah, so uh, ACA HTM is the software implementation of the software uh -huh. transaction memory, so it will give you certain classes that you can use to make your memory transactional. It doesn't give you the ability to use any write or read as a transactional. So if you just write into a field, it will not become magically transactional with ACA-STM. But it will give you classes that you can use uh, to do the atomic writes and reads from them. Oh, okay. So basically, they offer you uh, the library yeah, okay. for that. And before, we had a question about not consuming all the resources with the completable futures. And of course, you can do that. Uh, but by default, completable future asynchronous task will be executed on the pre-configured forgen pool. Uh, so if you do something uh, blocking in there, you will stall the resource, stall the JVM itself uh, pretty easily. Uh, and yeah, you can still consume all the resources without thinking about that. But the completable future, what it gives you, it doesn't give you the easier access to managing the parallel computation. Uh, or concurrent computation and the communication between things, but it will give you easier time uh, building a system out of those individual uh, com computational blocks. And it will uh, allow you to use the type system in Java to make those components that execute things in parallel communicate with each other. So instead of kind, kind of passing data between two different threads, you kind of say, oh, this, my data will sit in this completable future instance. And now, here's the function that I want to execute on that data. There is a function that I want to execute on that data. So instead of bringing data to the code, kind of you bring the code to the data. That's, a, that's the idea of completable future. But you can blow up the resources easily. Uh, so all of them can, uh, all of them accept the, uh, you can pre-configure a thread pool that you would like in the way that you would like and pass that to the actor system and say they will use, instead of just stalling the whole JVM, they will have just access to those resources 
uh, that you provide. Forge and pool can be configured this way. Actors can be configured this way. Fibers can be configured this way. Uh, software transaction memory offers you the library. So uh, it's more about uh, executing operations. Also takes, uh, you can configure the scheduler yourself.